I want you to imagine it's 12.30 at night. You close your eyes to sleep. You think about the bus driver that morning. Nice guy. You think about how you embarrassed yourself because you were impatient in line, or you were late to class, or because you sent the email that you really should have left in the drafts folder, right? Never send an email from the drafts folder. You think, and it keeps you up, and you get worried. I check my phone, but no, you don't, because the room is dark, it's cool, you're under the covers. And as the anxieties and the embarrassments fade, as the thoughts about what you did or didn't do, what you want or didn't want, what you got or didn't get, as those disappear, something else comes to take its place. Something else that might be a conversation you have, a conversation without words, with somebody who doesn't exist. You might imagine diagrams or cities. You might tell stories. You might, in this state, solve a problem in your real life. And if the problem's important enough, then it might jolt you awake. But if it doesn't, in those minutes before you sleep, your mind is at play. Just as much as when you were a child, playing in a park on a Sunday afternoon. Just as much as when you're engaged in the activities that give your adult life meaning, because play is larger than a playground. Play is what we do when the universe forgets to give us a task. And this is weird, right? Because as a scientist, I spend most of my time, we spend most of our time talking about activities that have a purpose, right? We have departments of economics and political science. We have schools of business. And because we spend so much time talking about those things, and not talking about play, we forget that play exists. But play permeates our lives. From the seconds to the centuries, we play when we appreciate a beautiful piece of art. We play, some of us, when we get dressed in the morning. We play when we figure out how to say hello to our friends. We play when we hear jazz. We play when we dance. We watch people play on stage when they do improv comedy. We play in our spiritual lives when we meditate. We play when somebody invites us to dinner and a conversation lasts for three hours. We play when we stay up all night in a college dormitory room talking. We play not just when we appreciate art, but when we make it. We play when we do Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, like, a dark secret is, scientists, sometimes we have a job, we're testing hypotheses, but most of the time what we're doing is we're trying to get money so we can just play. We just want to do it, we just want to play, we just, we're curious. It's really hard to write grants and get money to do that, so we, we, we say something else. <laughs> we, we, we play, right, we play, we go on the internet and we make up fake names and we argue. If we're lucky, we play in our most intimate human relationships, in love and friendship and marriage and child rearing. We play if we're lucky over the course of an entire life in our hobbies. And play exceeds us. Civilizations play, cultures play, when they discover mathematics, when they write poetry, when they philosophize, when they play music. I said we don't talk so much about play. It's not entirely true. People do talk about it. Here's John Dewey. John Dewey, educational philosopher, invented the lab school at the University of Chicago. He describes play as an attitude of freedom, free from subordination to an end. We're not the only animals that play. Gordon Burkhart talks about how the non-human animals play when they're not governed, when they're not governed by evolution, when they're not preoccupied with the four Fs, right? Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and reproductive success. <laughs> Aristotle. It's a biology joke. Aristotle, there's not that many. Aristotle talks about play. He doesn't call it play, he calls it idleness. He praises it. It's very un-American. And for Aristotle, music comes the closest to true idleness, the idleness of a gentleman. One day, maybe, when the robots do it all for us, we will all have to read Aristotle. So when I wanted to understand play, I actually, I, I didn't look at music because I'm terrible at music. I can't read musical scores. And I turned to mathematics instead. That's surprising, right? Mathematics, it seems like the least playful thing, right? You have a spreadsheet. If the numbers don't add up. Everybody's fired. <laughs> mathematics, actually, it turns out that that's, that's old mathematics. That's like 400 years ago. Mathematics was still tied to the real world. Let me tell you what mathematics has been up to in the last 400 years. This is a, a piece of mathematics called the Banach-Tarski paradox. It says that if you take an orange and peel it into five pieces, and you're really careful about how you peel it, you can reassemble it to cover two oranges of equal size. 
That makes no sense, right? I mean, if it was true, it would revolutionize how we, how we harvested oranges. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just the rules the mathematicians follow are no longer constrained by a need to describe or answer to reality. This leads to the Calvin ball problem. If you know Calvin ball, Bill Watterson, the great cartoonist, theorist to play, you might say, and his most playful creature of all, Calvin and his imaginary tiger Hobbes, they play this game, it's called Calvin Ball. The problem with Calvin Ball is that every move in the game, the rules change. The game evolves just as fast as it's played. And so if mathematics no longer has to answer to the real world, if you can peel an orange into five pieces and get two, well, what stops it from becoming just a system governed entirely by whim? So. I said I wanted to study mathematics. I couldn't because the mathematicians were too disorganized, so I got the next best thing, like second rate. It's the string theorists. String theory comes out of physics, okay? So physics is like getting hit by balls and styrofoam cups sticking to you, okay? The string theorists are given a simple problem. Just tell me, like, take a quantum mechanical object like an electron and just tell me the gravitational field. And they said, no problem, we'll be back. It turned out it took them longer than they expected. They still haven't solved the problem. They tried the obvious things and the less obvious things, and now they proceed almost entirely by indirection. The stories they tell have no connection to experimental evidence. The things they predict can never be tested, even if the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland was the science of the solar system, whether or not you include Pluto, right? Now, for some very smart people, this is a total disaster, right? I don't take a position on this. For me, it's great, right? Because the less that string theorists try to answer to the world, the less they try to describe the world, the more the playful aspect of science is brought to the fore for them. So we got this data, we got 10 years of string theory, 26,000 articles, right, super fun. Now, I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read all those articles, I don't think anyone's read them all, right, but here's one of them. What we're going to do, we're just going to project it down, like this is a beautiful idea, okay, we're just going to take a projection, like just look at the shadow, forget me, look at my shadow, it's got to capture some of me, right. We're going to project it out, and I'm just going to, like, it's awful. I'm just going to count the words. This took this guy hundreds of hours. I'm just going to turn it into a list of words, and I'm going to look at how the patterns of word usage shift. I'll tell you what happens, right? We can look, in other words, at how this article, the way those physicists use words, how those related to what came before. And then I can also talk about how those patterns relate to what comes next. I can tell you how this article deviates from what came in the past, right? It's on the x-axis here. Each of these dots is a paper, right? So on this screen, it's hundreds of thousands of physicist hours, right? It's going to be gone in a second. I'm sorry, right? On the x-axis here, the further along you get, the more innovative, the more the article differs from what came before. On the y-axis, conversely, on the y-axis is how much it differs from the future. So what does that mean? If you're really different from the future, that's a polite way of saying that you've been forgotten. Right? Oh, wow, it's like you're really different from what's going to happen next. It's almost a threat. Okay, so let's do a little science together, right? We'll do some hardcore, whoa, they co-vary. So what does this mean? This is the first law, right? Well done, right? You're, you're all stats majors now, right? Well done, this is the first law of play. The first law of play is really simple. What is new is quickly forgotten. And you know this because when you did that math problem set and the grad student was like, wow, that's, that's really innovative. I've never seen anyone solve a problem like that before. Doesn't mean you did a good job, right? <laughs> means no one solved it that way before and they're never going to solve it that way again, right? So that's the first law of play. What hasn't been seen before won't be seen much again. But let's zoom in a little bit. Let's take some of these. Look at this guy, right? Look at this guy here, right? He's way out on the x-axis. He's really new. He's doing something that hasn't been seen before. But notice he's below the black line, which means, in fact, that he wasn't forgotten. This article has 101 citations, top 5% of all the articles in our database in terms of how much it got cited, right? That's a lot of likes if you're an academic, <laughs> right? So this is the second law of play, right? While it's true that what's new is quickly forgotten, right? Some of what is new becomes what drives the future of the system. The system selects from the new to decide what to do next. So think about this like a dinner party, right? A dinner party where everybody is just talking randomly is no fun. It's not a good party. You need some kind of inertia in the system to slow it down. People need to talk to each other. If everybody just says something new, some set of words that no one's ever said before, they, really, what, right? But at the same time, if a three-hour dinner party goes on and on and on, and you're still talking about the same thing, it's a terrible dinner party. So this is a story about how the conversation of string theory evolves, how it decides where to go next, right? If you can date string theory, if you call it a part of mathematics, it's been going on since Archimedes. In that case, it's the 3,000-year dinner party. Right? So look, once we discovered we could do this, right? this is what I did with all the money that you paid me at Indiana, thank you. 
right? We were like cats in a, in a drum of like flightless birds, right? I mean, we just went nuts and we studied, right? All the kinds of activities, the most important activities that at least I think are important, science, poetry, right? Jenny studied, how does Yeats play, right? How did Robert Creeley play? How did Gwendolyn Brooks play? Jamie and Colin looked at it, and they began this. Jamie and Colin began by looking at how Charles Darwin, right? Trust a ferian, right? Get a job, right? He played in science until he discovered evolution. Alexander studies how people learn to play when their country emerges from dictatorship. How people talk when they become free. We learned a huge amount. I'll just tell you one story. We learned from Wikipedia with Brady. Who here doesn't know what Wikipedia is? You're lying, because I know you write papers and you stick Wikipedia in them. You get caught. Because come on, I've seen that before, right? Yes, it's true, it's something that survived, but you didn't do it. In Wikipedia, right, most edited article on this gentleman, George W. Bush, when I began this, there's 44,000 edits, people just keep changing it. They keep developing and altering and adding to and taking out what's in that article because they're trying to figure out what the point of Wikipedia is. Nobody actually knows what it, the point is, right? It's not just to help you write your papers. Maybe it's like some kind of weird Star Trek Encyclopedia Galactica. Maybe it's a blog. Nobody knows. They're trying to figure it out. If you try to actually, if you look up what's the purpose of Wikipedia, it's actually it's really hard to find. You can't find it. Anyway, if you look at how this system evolves over time, you see these spikes. So on the x-axis is time, right? As the system evolves over time, you see these spikes of innovation. And in fact, those spikes seem to come not quite at regular intervals. We don't know what causes them. They're not caused by something outside. They're not associated with elections. When people change the page, when it's modified in a way that hasn't been seen before, we see these sort of paradigm shifts, right? Writ small, right? This is just the George Bush page. It's not the Copernican model of the universe, but it'll do. Right? We say, where do those bursts come from, right? In 2004, what happened there? What was going on? What caused the novelty to enter the system? Well, we have one answer, and the answer is arguments, fighting, conflict. It's really strange. It turns out that associated with the introduction of novelty in a system is disagreement as people fighting. In fact, fighting so badly that they sometimes get thrown off the system. Maybe this is a law of play, right? To play well doesn't always mean to agree with your friends. We don't quite know what the nature of the argument is. Some arguments are destructive, but others aren't. If we can understand how people discuss and fight, and complain and debate. If we can understand that, maybe we can understand how to make play better. We recognize play instantly in a child. This is kinesthetic play, right? This is the play of an engineer testing a structure, the play of a dancer learning her skeleton. And once we see that, once we see the rubric, we can see how the things we do as adults fall in the same pattern. The kinds of activities that we think are not being driven by an external goal that seem to have no purpose, have a logic to them. It's why, by the way, you can't throw out your stuffed animals from when you were a child, right? They move you, they move us in ways that we can't quite explain, right? The clothes you wore when you were a child, the bed you slept in, even photographs of you with your parents. Forget it, throw it out, I don't care. Sorry, Mom. But somehow these, these creatures move us because these were the first things that we played with, these toys, the things we made them say and think and do, the, way we, the ways we made them move how we shared them with others. Somehow this was how we became who we are. And we can't, we can't get rid of them. What moves me is that these things, balancing on a log, talking over dinner, playing as a child, remembering what it was like to tell stories. What, what moves me is that those intimate moments of a human life, somehow, they seem somehow contained in the logic of the things that we think distinguish us most grandly from the other animals, the things that we think are the purpose of survival itself, the things that we want to do when all of our goals are satisfied. Play. Thank you. <laughs>